Let us begin with a word of prayer. We are launching off our study in stress, anxiety, and depression, why Christians experience these things, and why and how God does not desire the Christian to do so, and what God has provided that the Christian doesn't. So, in order to, we're going to be looking at a great number of passages as we work our way through this study, dealing with this on stress, anxiety, and depression, and cover a great number of subjects, working our way around. There'll be some order to it, but primarily we're just going to <clears throat> keep working through a lot of different things and not spending too much time on any one passage except to reap what is there for our study, dealing with this very important study. As I've told you, I didn't plan on going this way, but there is, I mean, I haven't even hardly started it, and we're already getting requests and and people uh, talking about it, wanting it, so it's something we need to work on. But we need to be in the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that He can open our eyes to the passages. Because I'm looking at, we'll be looking at a number of passages that we have looked at over the years, but I have never come to these passages from this point of view, uh, the, having, allowing the Spirit to open my eyes in this area, because this has not been an area that I've uh, uh, really launched into, but there's just so much from the first book written of Job all the way through the Bible. So it is a vital issue. And so let's spend a few moments in prayer and orient ourselves to our study and allowing the Spirit of God to open our eyes to what He would have us to see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray now that your Spirit will open our eyes to the things that you would have us to see in the next few moments as we study the Scriptures together. We now launch, Heavenly Father, into something that deals with our very lives all day long. While stress, anxiety, and depression have always been characteristic of man from the very beginning, it seems, Heavenly Father, at least in our society in America, that it has intensified in the body of Christ. So, Father, we pray that we can see the things that you would have us to see and they become realities in our lives. To this end, Father, we do pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> now, as I said, we're studying why Christians experience stress, anxiety, and depression. And we're going to look at passages, but I kind of want to also not just lay back on the study itself, but launch into the study. And so, uh, what we're looking at, Satan's... We have three great enemies that bring about stress, anxiety, and depression. And I'll just we'll start there. There are three great enemies to this. And the first great enemy to all of this is Satan. And we're going to take a look at Satan, what we're calling Satan's lie, uh, and, and note that. But I don't want everything blamed on Satan. And that's very important. This is where a lot of uh, people, Christians, uh, sort of drop away. They want to blame everything on the adversary. And certainly we have a lot in the Scriptures that we're going to deal with the adversary. But I want you to realize there is also the world. The world also is a great cause. The cosmos, the cosmic system that we live in, is a great source of stress, anxiety, and depression. That's the very world that we live in. But third, both of these, Satan and the world, play on the third one. It's not like it's separated from the other two. And that is the flesh. The flesh are the real you, who and what you are, the, uh, the, the person that you are, your person, that this is, when I say real, I'll deal with the word real in a little while, but the flesh person in you, uh, that old man, that uh, nature, that carnal nature, but the flesh person that we are as we were born from our mother's womb. Now, Satan is going to use the world, and he's also going to use the flesh to bring about his lie. And Satan's lie runs something like this 
as he picks it up from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all the way through Scripture. And Satan's uh, most effective lie in our study is that those who have failed, those who are losers, are unworthy of love. And they deserve to be condemned and punished. This is very strong with them, and it's very strong in our thinking. People uh, sow and reap. That's very big with a lot of Christians. Sow and reap. And, of course, it isn't what's going on in Scripture, but that's what people like to do with it. And if you do something bad, you've got to pay for it. You're unworthy of love, unworthy. You need to be punished. It's an effective lie. And the thing about this is, this is the way the world is. This is the way it has been from the time of a tree, and I'll be coming back to this tree, of knowledge of good and evil. This also, Satan's big lie, is going to be picked up from the law. So this is taught in Scripture, if that's what you want to see. And that's why preachers are often the biggest support, and they keep Christians in this lie by preaching it. But he wants to take your experiences. What this lie does, it takes your experiences of the past and uses them against you. And he has so much to work with in a lot of people's past today because there's so much that go on in Christians' past in the past, and especially in America. And that's what I'm dealing with today. It's the time I'm on the scene of history. All of us have experienced as we were growing up and developed some, and another word we're going to come to here, have developed some of the strongest, what I'm going to call, and I'll show you why as we go through this, some very strong strongholds. Some very strong strongholds. Now, let me tell you, first of all, why we'll be using that word. Because we all have strongholds in our soul that Satan can grab hold of and cause us to live under his lie. When the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt, and then they were in the wilderness, and they came, they came up to Jordan. And if you'll remember, when they sent the spies across, what kept the people, the majority of the people, from going on over in faith was the strongholds over here scared them, and it kept them from advancing. Well, we have strongholds in our soul that we develop over our lifetime from our childhood. We develop some strongholds in the soul, and we're going to have to know how to deal with those strongholds, and there are some very powerful passages on how to deal with them. But we have a lot of, and some people have a lot more than others, and some people have more defined than others, but we all have various strongholds in our soul, things that we've experienced. And they, they become strongholds for Satan and for other Christians to keep you down, to build up stress, to build up depression inside of a believer's soul. And they were formed as we grew up. And we have experiences. A lot of us have experiences being hurt. And as children, when we didn't understand it, a great deal of abuse today, not just in little girls, but also in little boys now. A great deal of physical abuse, verbal abuse, and it is amazing how many Christians are trying to deal with that in America today as adults. Children, as we grew up, have been manipulated. Often people will, that have experienced a lot of these things in their childhood will go into a marriage and it will continue in their marriage, and they don't understand why. But they let these things happen throughout their life, or these things did happen, or that they allowed it, they did happen in their childhood, and they still experience abuse. They still experience being manipulated, being treated unjustly, uh, and uh, a lot of these kinds of things, and controlled, being controlled as they would grow up and taught that way as little boys and little girls, and these things continue on. There's a whole other area that develops with a lot of them. Their parents loved them, but what happened was their parents were very high on performance and demanded such a standard of performance, such a scale of performance, that this became the whole identification of the person. 
their parents were very strict, very strict about performance. It may have been in grades. It may be in some form of accomplishment, uh, in some sport or, or some talent, music, whatever it might have been. And the parent just demanded some form of a performance. And all of these things, people, and so many more, I'm just jumping, I'm jumping right into this deal and uh, what we're talking about. And a lot of these things, they start building up strongholds and problems in the soul. And uh, it, it becomes very powerful down in, inside of a person's soul. And so as we start to grow up as children in these environments, <clears throat> self-worth starts coming into play. Don't mock self-worth. Don't laugh at it. It is essential to the creature, our self-worth. And what begins to happen is our self-worth starts to being developed that my self-worth, it becomes based upon what? It starts becoming based on my performance. My performance plus others' opinion of me. And I'm going to broaden that, but I'll just lay a lot of foundation down tonight. I'm going to broaden that to certain others' opinion. Not just everybody's necessarily, but certain others' opinion. It may be the mother, the father, husband, wife, some grandparent, somebody in childhood. And as we grow up and this is held, maybe the preacher, maybe the church, maybe people in the church. Because the church, people, I'm going to show you that one of the reasons people do not live who they are in Jesus Christ is because of the church. The church keeps more people from living who you are in Christ than almost anything else. It's one of Satan's great tools, preachers, that preach performance in the Christian realm. You've got to perform in being your moral righteousness. Perform in your knowledge of Bible doctrine. Performance in your charismatic experience. Performance in your Christian life. Performance in doing. Performance in giving money. Performance. And that's the whole thing that God is looking for, they say. Your whole relationship with God is your performance. And so it starts tying in with things that we experienced as childhood, and we begin to realize and think that this is my self-worth, my performance, plus others' opinion of me. And don't think little of others' opinion of me. This is even, and I'm, I'm not going to say it's more powerful than performance, but people, it's just as powerful in the Scriptures. Who crushed Job's soul? Was it Satan? No. God? No. Who crushed his soul? Three friends. Three believing friends crushed his soul. And that's the word used, and we're going to look at it. That's one of our key words, and, and we're going to see in the Old Testament for what happens to the soul when stress and depression. And I'm just not worthy to serve God. And I'm just not worthy to take my place in the spiritual realm and to perform as God would have me to perform. I'm just not worthy. The soul is crushed. And boy, to uncrush a soul is, is to, or to heal that soul is a, just a powerful thing that we're going to be looking at all the way through. But it's his three friends, people, that crushed this man's soul. Remember that. Remember that. Others' opinion. You may not think, oh, well, I don't care about others' opinion. Oh, yes, you do. You deceive yourself if you don't think you do. Because what a lot of people do is, I don't care about others of people's opinion, and they run off and hide. Why are they running off and hiding and not even trying? Why are they not doing anything? Because they care about others' opinion and they're afraid they'll fail. So it's nice to talk big. But this study's not going to allow that. This study's going to go into the Scriptures of what's going on inside of us. Crushed my soul. And how do they do it? With their words. Job is in a performance standard. That's their whole deal. And he cares about their opinion. And they crushed his soul. And I'm going to show you things that he did. He cursed the day that he was born. That's what starts to happen when you live in Satan's lie. Because Satan has a stronghold. And Job's three friends are a beautiful example of how Satan reaches in through his servants, other Christians even, and start pulling on those strongholds in our soul and you don't feel like you're worthy to serve God. You don't feel like you're worthy to perform for God. 
So this whole performance thing is one of the biggest lies that Satan has to use against us from people's childhood, their home life, and growing up. Your failure. I'm, I'm totally amazed at the number of adults and younger people I hear talking and tell, yeah, their parents told them they were a failure. Just, you're no good. And husbands tell wives that. I'm totally amazed, but it apparently is an extremely common thing to be told by your parents you're a failure. Just shut up and sit down. Don't even try because you can't do it anyway. And all of this type of, of uh, things that go into it. Some people, some people, parents are perfectionists. And the way they survive in the, in the rap race of the world is they set up this high, rigid standard for themselves. And then they strive to perform at that level. And they feel good about themselves if they do it. And they feel horrible about themselves if they do not. And we're going to come to what types of things we do with ourselves and with others around us when we're in that type of a trap. We're going to look at that in great detail. Because this is a great source of stress, depression, both to that person and to those others, their children and other people who have to live with that type of a, uh, some kind of perfectionist standard. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to come across a perfectionist standard, and if you want to try to perform for God, let me tell you what a standard is, and I'll show this to you in the Bible, and we're going to build our way up to this one, but it just, I'm led to bring it to this point. God is perfect, and He demands perfection. So don't play games. If you're going to try to approach God on performance and be worthy to serve God, and you think you're so wonderful, know His standard perfection. And if you can't do it, forget it. So we're going to learn a lot about what happens and how this translates into the home and into our soul. One of the worst things that can happen to a person, and we've seen this already, one of the worst things that can happen to a person is to set up, set up their high standards of performance, their list, and be good at it. One of the worst things that can happen to you, to be good at your high standards because you're never going to come to the point where you will walk as who you are in Jesus Christ. You will be content and satisfied with your perfection, your ability, and you'll demand that of others, including your children, husband and wife, and our wife. So these are some of the things that we're going to be dealing with. There are the people who are the non-perfectionists. And that's like they get along in life pretty well. No. They care so much, they just quit trying even. Get their self-worth out of performance, so they just start withdrawing, and we're going to study that. So these are some of the strongholds that Satan builds up inside, or that, that we build up inside of our soul, and have built up inside of our soul, and Satan just reaches down and will use them to bring you down. He brings them up a lot, depending on the degree and what he's doing with you in your life. So we've got a lot to study and the source of this stress, the source of this depression about who I am and what I am and where am I going and what's these things, what are these things about. Now, we started and began New Year's Eve, our study, on a very positive, powerful passage. So let's turn to Colossians 3 because we're not through there. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> And as I said, my purpose is not a lengthy time under any one passage, and I'd like to hopefully finish this tonight and not have this continue. I've got segments I'd like to study each class, each, have each class, not like a continual, the, the series is continual, but each class hitting it from a different aspect. So uh, let's try to finish this tonight. So let's read the passage together that we're going to be looking at. What we're dealing with are believers who, because of their flesh nature, had developed stress and anxiety and depression even about their Christian life, about their marriage life, about their life in general. And Satan will come along and use these strongholds to keep us in that place. Verse, uh, ch verse 1 of chapter 3 of Colossians. We started this, but let's just read the four verses and then get back to work. If our sense, remember we saw this in the first class condition, since then you have been raised up with Christ, that's a fact.
keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Well, right here we have one of the greatest solutions to a stressful life, and that is seeking the things above. So much of the stress and anxiety that we experience in our life that keep us from moving, keep us from other things that God has in store, is because it's related to the things of the earth. Verse 2, set your mind. We're going to have to look at Proverbs 23. As a man thinketh, so he is. Set your mind, set your thinking. Where? On the things above. You'd be surprised how many things on this earth just don't bring about stress if you're able, if you get to where you'll allow the Spirit to do this. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. People, the things that are on earth are going to cause you depression, are going to cause you stress related to work, performance, even your marriage, so many areas of life. Verse 3, you have died. Note how Paul reverses the order. We should have studied your die, but he starts off in verse 1, you have been raised up. Then verse 3, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. A great deal of the stress that people experience in depression is because of what? Because of others' opinion, what they see. People, your life is hidden. This is very powerful. Don't look for your praise and greatness on earth. Your life is hidden. And do you know what? It may be even hidden to those closest to you. Job's friends never did figure out what was going on with Job. I think they did after chapter 42, but as far as recorded history, it's hidden. Your life is hidden. Don't become stressed about things that are revealed. Your life is hidden. Verse 4, it's going to be revealed. When Christ who is our life, wow, now do you think that's going to bring you stress or depression? Not at all. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Okay, let's get to work now on this passage because it's a very important introduction to being who you are in Christ and how to handle the stress and this depression that goes on in people's lives. All right, let's look at verse 1. If, first class condition in the Greek sense. Now what this means is this is reality. And again, I want to give you a very important principle. One of the most difficult things for a believer to do is to believe is true all that God says about you. And here's the first thing that God says about you in our study. Since you have been raised up with Christ. Now, people, there's simple little statements all along here. Not, I, really, I don't think I'll ever go along with just 15 points, 10 points. It'll be, it'll be just all the way through it. Sometimes I get lost in doing that. But if this is true of you, that you've been raised up with Christ, then I want you to appreciate the fact that any time you experience stress and depression and these things that we're looking at, unworthiness, you've just slapped God in the face. You've just slapped Him in the face. I'm not who you say I am. I'm who Satan says I am. I'm who the world says I am. <coughs> I'm in who my parents, my spouse, my friends say I am. I'm not who you say I am, God. I know you don't see that way when you're under when we do, when we're under the stress. We don't see that people. I'm going to show you very strongly through this study. It's what you're doing. I'm not who you say I am. I'm a really a horrible, horrible person. I'm a wretched person, and I'm not who you say I am. Okay. Since then you have been raised up with Christ. Air is passive indicative of the verb meaning to rise up together. The air is tense, people. This is a fact. Once and for all, it's over. You have been raised up with Christ. Passive voice, you received this by grace, not by anything you did, not by performance, but simply by your faith. You have been raised up in Christ. This is a fact. This is who and what you are. One of the most difficult things, again, is believing what God says you are. No, I want to believe what I see when I look in the mirror. 
And I'll be using this illustration over and over to where you probably get tired of it and it will lose its effectiveness, but I hope not. But the, ana the girl with anorexia looks in the mirror. She looks in the mirror and she sees uh, she weighs about 93 pounds, but she looks in the mirror and she sees a very, very grotesquely fat woman. Now, how is she going to live experientially day in and day out like a fat person? She's not going to eat. She's not going to want to be in public because that's who I really am. I am that fat person. I am that gross person there. That's who I am. And I am ashamed of who I am. I can't handle that. So they don't eat. Or they develop the techniques of, of bringing their food back out that they do put into their body. They don't go into public. Now, is that true? Not in a minute. She looks like a lot of us would like to look. But she is by no means overweight. But it's truth to her. And look what it did to her life. And this is what Christians do. They look in the mirror and they're going to see this horrible person that's a failure. They can't perform. And they're going to look and that's the way they're going to live. Is that who they are? No. Here's who they are. Raised up with Christ. Now the second part of what happened. Let's take a look. Uh, let's look back with me for a moment. As I'm saying this is the second part. Look back at verse chapter 2 with me a minute. Chapter 2. Now our passage says, Since you have been raised up with Christ. This is the other side of chapter 2 verse 21. It says in Colossians. It says, Since, if, since, first class condition, since you have died with Christ, crucified with Him, to the elementary principles of the world. What are the elementary principles of the world? Performance. People, it goes all the way back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the elementary principles of the world. That's how man thinks. If I perform... God will bless me. If I'm good, God will be good to me. Job, Adam and Eve. That's the elementary principles of the world. Continuing verse 21. Why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? Now look at the way he worded it. As if you were living in the world. What does he mean by that? I am living in the world, Paul. No, that's what Paul's whole point is. While you and I function here, this isn't our domain. We don't live related to the things of earth, but to the things above. Why do you submit? And then he just uh, curse through. Do not handle. Do not taste. Do not touch. Do and do. Don't do. Do and do. Don't do. Which all refer to things destined to perish with the using. I like that. Not only do to, to perish with the end of time, which is what a lot of stuff will, but just with the using. In accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. And this becomes one of the great sources of depression, of stress, anxiety, and dealing with what I can't do, what I can't do, and this whole performance thing. Okay, here's what we're looking at. First, crucified with Christ. That's the death, death of the old you. That's the death of your old flesh, and that's death to all the things related to the earth. Raised with Christ, that's living in the new man. That's living who you are in Christ. But it's very difficult for us to, to get a hold of living who we are in Christ. Now verse 1 of chapter 3. Since therefore you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Dying in Christ, people, dying in Christ has its implications on our lives, but please remember, being raised with Christ has its implications on our lives. Being crucified with Christ has its implications. Being raised with Christ has its implications. Chapter 2, verse 12. Look at it with me. Please. Having been buried with Him in baptism, death, in which you were also raised up with Him. I hear he has them in the order, dead, dead and buried, raised up, life, through faith, by means of faith. 
in the working of God. People, do you see it? It's God's performance. It's God's performance. It's not yours. You don't make yourself adequate. God makes us adequate. You can't take away what God does. This is what God does for us. So dying with Christ, what's that? Past action, done. Raised with Christ, past action, done by faith. Since our death with Him, what did it do? It severed all links and connections, all dependencies, people, that bound us with the old self. Did you hear me? This is what I'm saying is the hard thing for us to grasp. Being crucified with Christ and dying with Him released us, separate us from all dependencies that bound us with the old self, with the old order, with this world. I'm sorry, people. Your performance in this world, how much money you make, where you live, what kind of car you drive, all these kinds of things, they don't matter. You have been set free of all of those kinds of stressful things. All those things that we calculate that we have lived a good life. Well, have, well you lived a good life. Yeah, I have a good car, a nice home, and I got this, and got good security in old age, and boy, I just lived a great life. How false and phony! How shallow! How shallow! I lived a great life. I've got all I got a home now, security, all these things taken care of. My children are taken care of. Boy, I have lived a great life. And that's the way most Christians live. And it's shallow. It's shallow. You can be a beggar at the rich man's gate like Lazarus and have lived the life God wanted you to live. People our life doesn't relate to these things on this earth. Just don't relate to the things on this earth. They relate to the things above. So it set us free of all of that. Now, our being raised with Christ means that we are not tied into the old order, but we're now tied into the new order. And what's the new order for us? Heavenly. Spiritual. My marriage. My time, my life, its value, my worth now becomes what? The spiritual. But this is so hard to do. This is why very few Christians will live a life free of stress, anxiety, and depression. I'm not teaching these things like I've mastered all of this. I'm teaching these things so that we can all make this journey together. But what, what he's saying in this passage is we're buried with death in him, then we're cut free, people. You're just cut free of Satan's lie. My self-worth is performance plus others' opinion. You're set free of that. It's, you're cut loose of that. That doesn't matter. It's not the issue. But now, since you have been, we've been raised up with him, we're now linked in with a new order, a heavenly one, an eternal one. And what you want to remember from this passage is that this will often be what? Hidden from the world. Hidden. The world won't see it and understand it. Very few Christians can see and understand why Samson's name is in Hebrews chapter 11. You read through his life and there's hardly anything in there that gives you any reason why he should be in Hebrews 11, the greatest chapter of the Bible of, of faith heroes. People, your life's hidden. Now, in the earth, if we live toward the earth, they can see your home. They can see your accomplishments. They can see the chariot. They can see all of these wonderful things, people. They might see in various ministries, oh boy, they have this and they have that. They have television. They have all of this kind of stuff. But your life's hidden because the world doesn't want to pay attention. And much of the body of Christ gets hooked up into the world. It won't pay any attention to the hidden. It's that what the world sees so again, there are experiential things that happen to us sharing the death of Christ. There are very definite things that should happen to us experienced with Him when we're raised with Him. Base example, there are very definite things that happen when we divorce. 
Right here is a man and woman. We'll pick on the woman because we are the bride of Christ. When the woman is married to this man, when there is a divorce, we'll call that the death. Because Paul does this in Romans 6. So the man dies. There, there, there's a divorce. Okay. Because of that divorce, there are a lot of things that have changed experientially. She doesn't go to bed with them. She doesn't live with them. She doesn't share these things. All the, there's so many things experientially that change. This woman, same woman, now marries another man. That's being raised up in Christ. The whole new things are now to start happening. She now shares her whole new life with this new husband. Everything now is related to him and nothing is to be related. But what happens to a lot of us as Christians in our study, we go back and we still want to perform for that old husband, for that former life, for that person that we once were, the flesh self that we once were. We'll talk about those kinds of things. Look with me at Romans chapter 6, please. Romans chapter 6. And in Romans chapter 6, let's look at verse 2. Romans 6, 2. We'll start at verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? By the way, any pastor is teaching grace through faith, saved by faith, spirituality by faith is going to be accused is going to be accused of teaching this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound, be increased? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin? Now, when did we die to sin? When we were buried and crucified with Christ. When we died with Christ, we died to sin. Still live in it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So that we can understand it without a lot of breakdown, it's like... How do we go back with that first husband when it's divorced? It's still over. It's dead. Verse 3. Or is it that you do not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus and have been baptized into His death? And that death set us free of a whole lot of things. Therefore, verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, God does it, so we too might walk in the newness of life. See, people, it's that newness of life that we're talking about. That's who you are in Christ. It's a whole new life. And one of our great problems that we're going to study in living who you are in Christ, believing who you are in Christ, is that living in the flesh is a big big habit. We've been doing it since birth. We feel very comfortable, even as Christians who want to walk in the Spirit, things go wrong in our life, things start happening. What is that? What do I mean by that? We start losing control. People aren't doing what we want. Children aren't doing what we want. Husbands aren't doing what we want. Wives are not doing what we want. <clears throat> Friends are not doing what we want. So what do we do? We go back to a habit. And our habit is our flesh nature. And why wouldn't it be a good habit? We've been doing it all our life. We're very familiar with our old self. Sometimes we don't even like our old self, but we're familiar with it. We know how it's going to re react and respond. So we go back to it. What we're going to have to do, people, is develop a new habit. And I'm going to coach you and help you. That's what we're going to do in a study. Develop a whole new habit. Walking in the Spirit is going to become a habit. Walking in who you are in Christ has to become a habit. Something you do consciously as a man thinketh. And we're going to see how we're going to go through all of these things in, in this study. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Keep seeking the things. <clears throat> keep seeking. Since you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Okay, I hope you see it. Keep seeking the things above. This is very important on how to live a Christian life. Keep seeking the things above. Keep... Well, I need it strong because I want, I want you to be able to read this. Okay. Here we go. All right, keep... There we go. On seeking the 
things above. Okay. Let's talk about this because this is powerful. I want you to see how simple it is. Keep on. Well, when did I start? To keep on, I, I've got to have started it somewhere. Where did you and I start seeking the things above? When we started looking for salvation, restoration with God, being restored with God. That's when we started our little journey. That's when we started this. And many of you went through different ways. Some went through a lot of religion. Lived a long time thinking that the church had the answer. Some went through hell. Some went through a hurt. A lot of different ways. But we started seeking above. We started seeking God. A relationship with God. That brought us to the cross. That brought us to the Son of God. That brought us to simple faith. All right, now watch this. Where did you first learn? I can have the things above totally disor- dis- un- unrelated to anything on earth by just trusting Him. You learned it and when you started seeking. This is how I can get there. Now, what is Paul saying? Just keep on now. Keep on seeking those things above. Keep on seeking the spiritual. Keep on doing that. And we're going to see it's going to be done the same way, by faith. And it has nothing to do with your life. Nobody, people, nobody that has ever been saved did it because they were rich or because they were poor, didn't have any disadvantage to them. Our gospel is the exact same for every woman, every man, every old person, child, rich, poor, black, white, Muslim, Oriental, nothing. It has nothing to do with performance on earth. Bad people. Ooh, some really bad people are going to be in heaven with you. They're really bad here. Because they came to the gospel and heard it and believed. Had nothing to do with performance. Nothing. And every one of you sitting here know it, and I hope everyone on tape realized this by this point. You performed in no way to receive. You did not get to invite him into your heart. I know that's a very popular statement. I know where it comes from. But you didn't invite Jesus into your heart to be saved. When we invite, that verb means to do something. That's why we like it. That's why a lot of people like that word, because we get to be a part of it. I invite People, if I invite you over to my home, I've done it. I've done the inviting. There's a little merit there. People, you don't invite Jesus into your heart. God's giving the invitation. Come unto me. Oh, you are weary and heavy laden. You don't give the invitation. You have nothing to invite him to. Hey, God, Jesus, come into the gutter with me. Come into the manure pile with me. This is a great place. No. We respond by faith to His invitation. We didn't invite Him. We don't make Him Lord. It's just another sort of way man being in part of this whole thing gets to be part of the equation. I just, I want a little bitty part of my salvation People, you don't even get a little bitty part. You don't get to repent to be saved. You don't get to confess to be saved. You don't get to invite to be saved. Those are not words that are in the Scriptures for you. Stay with the Bible. Believe. Simply trust, and I will give it. Keep seeking the things that are above. What did we learn? What did you learn? Every one of us at the cross... No performance and nobody's opinion. Nobody's opinion saved me. Oh, you know what? And this is a major denomination. We've got some saints and we'll have them go talk to God about getting you saved. What? Opinion of others. God's going to listen to the opinion of others. No, not people. 
He's not dealing with your performance or opinion of others. That's how you got the eternal things above. That's how you ever got into this. That's how any of you keep on doing that. And boy, how does that refree us? Now, this can only relate to a few of you because we all come to the cross different ways. But you know, there are some people who come to the cross who worked in a church and a denomination and did what they said for a long time. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes along, some yo-yo comes along and says, all you got to do is believe in Jesus Christ and you're saved forever. What? That can't be true. I've been doing a lot of work. I've given a lot of money to the church. And you're telling me I didn't have to do any of that? Right. They become angry. They reject it. Got to shut you up. That can't be right. I performed. But to those who accept it, oh, what a great relief. Nothing on this earth had anything to do with getting the things above. Keep on doing that. What is that saying to you? Keep on living in who you are in Christ. Keep on living that new life. Keep on doing that so that you get into the things that are above and the things that are eternal. So keep on seeking because you were seeking the things above at the beginning, because you were thinking of terms in eternity, setting your mind on those things in eternity. Keep on doing that. Keep on seeking things above. Once again, people, the pattern has been established. As you have received Him, walk. Now, how do we keep on seeking the things above? This gets to what we studied Sunday morning. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. First of all, what do all those things mean? But even more importantly, how in the world do I do it? So we're going to have to ask the question, how do I seek the things above? How did you do it here? How did you do it at the cross? How did you do it at your your eternal life salvation? By faith. That's how you did it. Did you perform for it? No. Did you come up to God with the best works like Cain? And you labored and you really worked hard. You really offering God your very best. You're not offering God second best. This is your very best. No, we didn't offer him anything of our performance. How did we do it? By faith. Keep on doing it. That's how you're going to fulfill that. By faith. Since therefore you have been raised together with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Now, why does Paul word it this way? Why not heaven, as he did in chapter 1, verse 5, and verse 20? Things above. Why does he do that? People were talking about a spiritual contrast of two specific places. These are two specific uh, space places so that we can keep our minds straight on all of this. They're not one place. They're two entirely different places. It's like Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. You can't mix those two. Those are two entirely different historical places. Places and things that happened. Time and space is what they say. So that's what we're dealing with. A space, a place. Now you live in, in that place, in that space. So you got to decide which of those two you want to live in. I was in the military. I was in the United States Army. But you know where I lived for almost two years of my life? I lived in Germany. I was in Germany. But how did I live? I lived in reference to who and what I was as far as being an American is concerned. What happened in Germany did not bother me. Who they elected as their local uh, 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 public offices did not trouble me. I did not get depressed. I did not get uh, saddened. I did not get all worked up about what went on in Germany. And I was in Hanau. Didn't, didn't who the mayor was, all these people, didn't even bother me. Who won what sporting events, didn't even bother me. I was living there in Germany. That's where I slept, ate, worked, and where I lived. I lived as an American. More specifically, I lived as a United States personnel of the Army, United States Army. We are here on earth, as it were, an assignment. But this isn't where we need to get all stressed out about things related to it. I didn't get all stressed out about because I wasn't wearing really nice clothes like the like the, some of the nice Germans were. 
I didn't have the real nice clothes and go to the clubs where all the chicks were. I didn't have the nice clothes so I could make an impression. Either had army greens or just some clothes you might buy. Didn't drive a big fancy car. Didn't even have one. Did it bother me? No. Wasn't living there. That's not, that wasn't my whole setting my mind. My mind thinking wasn't in Germany. My mind frame and my mind setting was in America. That's how I lived. In that realm. I lived in a whole other realm than where I lived. I was living in a foreign country, Frankfurt, near Frankfurt, Germany, and Hanau, Germany, and all these places. But what went on didn't depress me. Germans get all upset they're going to build something or they're not going to build something. Didn't depress me. Didn't stress me out. All these kinds of things that they were going on that were very important to these people. Very important. Well, don't you even care about us? Don't you care about... You know, that, that's the whole point. I'm not going to get all stressed out. The things that happen down here, people, that we allow to pull us down, this is not where we leave, live. We should live in another whole realm. Question. Do you get stress, anxiety, and depression because of what happens here on earth? Then what you and I have to start realizing is that when we are depressed and have stress and anxiety about it, we're living in the wrong realm. The wrong realm. The things above. Why does he say that? A things above. Look at the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Gospel of John, chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. And let's look at verse 3. John 3, verse 3. Jesus there answered and said to them, to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, only it's not again, it's from above. People, this is where you're from. You're from above. This is where you're from. You're from above. We're not from here. The source of stress and depression, and it's from where we live, then we know we're oriented to the world. The earth, people, demands performance. This is not where you and I live. We are from above. This is where we're from. It's like, go back to my silly, my not silly, but uh, uh, example. I'm not from Germany. I'm not of Germany. I am from America. I'm not from there. So I don't get all caught up there. I am visiting there. And in a real sense, my life is hidden to the Germans. They just kind of blind us out that we're even there, and what we're there for. But as far as I'm concerned, just it didn't, it, those things did not matter to me. And so it becomes stress. When we become stressed, anxiety and, and, and depression people, one thing we know about ourselves, boy, I really am oriented to the earth right now. And you may, you may work it through where you want to say it's okay, and that's okay if you want stress and depression. But what we can honestly do, if we're honest with ourselves, then I am really living in this realm. Verse 3 of our, of our Colossians 3, let's go back to Colossians 3 now. Your life has been hidden, been hidden, and the world can't see it. Don't get all upset about the world. Don't let the stress be who you are in Christ. And, and stay with my little analogy. What did I have to be? I had to be who I was in the United States Army. In fact, the Army would not allow me to get involved in all of that stuff and express a lot of opinions like I'm speaking for America. That's why military personnel cannot uh, openly talk about what the uh, commander above him does or doesn't do. You don't do that. So we don't talk about what's, what's going on in the world. We don't talk about other things. It's not our deal. Our deal is what my commander tells me to do. That's all, my, that's all my concern is, not what's going on in Germany. And so it is with you and I, people. We, our life is hidden. We don't, we're not in this realm, in, that, in this world in that sense. Our life is hidden in that sense. Verse 1, Since therefore you have been raised up together with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Above is where we live. For above is where Jesus Christ is. Psalm 110, verse 1. We won't look there, but Psalm 110, 1 says, 
uh, my God. Let's look at it very quickly. Psalm 110, verse 1. Just so you can see it. This was what I wrote my thesis on in seminary. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, all right, the Lord God the Father, He is Lord, says to my Lord, that's Jesus Christ, sit at my right hand. People, again, don't let anybody take away the Lordship of God the Father and of the Holy Spirit. All three are your Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. So what's going on top side? Jesus Christ is sitting there. Now let's go back to our passage in verse 2. Colossians 3, 2. <clears throat> Set your mind. Uh Uh-oh, now we've gone on. Keep on seeking. Now we have another one that deals with whatsoever man thinketh. Keep. What is our passage now going to tell us to do? It says, set your mind. Okay, it's our second verb. We have two verbs here. Set your mind. Whatsoever man thinketh he is. Set your thinking. Set your mind. Aorist active indicative, apo, minesco. Oh, excuse me, that, 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 that's in another realm. This is the, uh, pre- I wonder how could it be an aorist. All right, present active imperative, the verb. For now, oh, comes from the root for mind, to think, to have a mindset. Activity of this word involves the mind plus will. In other words, what you set your mind on you're going to have that affect your will, the decisions you make. Set your mind. Set your mind. Get your mind set on that. What happens with stress, anxiety, and depression? Get our mind set on other things. These things start coming in and mess it all up. You get your mind set on this. Whatsoever man thinketh, how am I going to defeat? How am I going to experience the absence of stress in my life and depression and these things going on and anger and hurt and jealousy, bitterness, a lot of things that we're going to study later on that go on in our mind that bring about stress in our soul. Right here, people. I'm going to show you later as we go through this, depression is a choice. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. Depression is a choice. You choose to be depressed. You choose to be stressed. Now, I've got to do something very important here. I've got to do something very important. I want, to be, I want you to be careful what you hear because a lot of people like to use it as an excuse. There are people who do indeed experience these things that come up this way as stress and depression because of chemical imbalances. I am aware of that. I will not go there. I am not an expert in that area. I am not, I am not the sick. It would be wrong for me to get into that area. That is not what I'm talking about. That is between a person and a professional in that area. But I am qualified to talk about what's going on in Scripture. And those Christians who experience stress, anxiety, and depression throughout their life, and it's related to the spiritual realm, that's who I'm dealing with. I want to make that very clear. But I recognize, and we all need to recognize, the chemical imbalances and some medical things that go on in people. But uh, too often, I believe, a lot of Christians use that as an excuse for handling it and for walking by faith and who they are in Christ. But I would never judge that because that's not my place. But I'm talking about the majority of us who understand this isn't a chemical imbalance. This is because I'm living in, in the world. This isn't a chemical imbalance. Things are, he isn't just, he's not doing what I want him to do. It's not a chemical imbalance. It's a human imbalance. I'm going to knock him down so it'll be balanced. It's not a chemical imbalance. She just won't do what I want her to do. She won't think the way I want her to think. This isn't a chemical imbalance. The kid just didn't want to mind me. Didn't want to perform like I want him to perform. 
That's what we're talking about in this study. So let's be very sure that we've got that set in our souls about that. Set your mind. Involves the mind and the will. Now what are we to set our mind on? On the things above and specifically stated, not on the things that are on earth. Stress, anxiety, depression, anger, jealousy, bitterness, all these things, people, they're a choice. Now, there are going to be people who don't argue with me. Don't even argue with me. I know where you're coming from. I know you think it's not a choice. No, it's my children's fault that I'm falling apart. It's my husband's fault that I'm falling apart. It's, don't you see what you've done? You kids, don't you see what you've done to your mother? Look at your mother in the bedroom. It's your fault. No, it isn't. I'm sorry. It's not their fault. She has chosen to be stressed out and go into depression. That is a choice. Anxiety is a choice. You can set your mind to fall apart, or you can set your mind to live who you are in Christ. It's your choice. You can live by the things on earth, or you can set your mind to the things that are above and things that are eternal, and set your mind to that thinking when things don't work out your way. I will show you in the course of this of our study in the Scriptures on this subject that stress is another way to just get back into control. You've lost control. They aren't going to do what you want them to do. And so you stress. That's a way of putting you back into control. You're, you're in control of your own environment. You're in control of your own mind. It may sound weird, but it's a wonderful flesh technique. It's a wonderful technique of the flesh. And people are, have been doing it. They're habit. And they're good at it. By the time they become adults. Of uh, becoming stressful. Anxiety. Even depression. They're good at it. They develop a great habit. This is a habit. It's the way I get back into control. We look at compulsive behavior. People, you don't see them a lot, but they're doing things. What are they doing? They're back into control. They're in an environment where they think they sense that they're out of control. Got to get back into control. So I'm back into control. That's what all these things are. It's about control. I ain't control. My marriage, my family, my life, my money, my future, my present, this, that, I've been in control. That's what the flesh needs to do. The flesh, the flesh senses its vulnerability. The flesh senses its own weakness. And so it strives to be totally in control. And depression, I go for the big one, depression, it's just a way of getting back into control. You want to be in control. It is a choice. We become stressed out, become depressed. It's a choice. That's why you have these kind of passages. Set your mind. Set your thinking. Pick up the phone. Your child's just been killed on the on the road in, in, in a car wreck. Before you even put the phone down, I told you not to let them have a car. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. Why did they do this? Why do you do this to me? I choose. That's a choice. I have made that decision to go that way. Or I can make the decision. Put that phone down. We need to go into prayer. We need to set our thinking on something very tragic in our lives, a uh, tragic thing in our lives. We need to set our thinking above. We take my hand, hon, and let's go to prayer. Let's start thinking on the things above, not on the things of earth. What's the difference in those two? Just choice. Habit. This is a habit. Blame. We're going to study about blaming later on. We'll put it in the proper place. Always blame somebody else. It's a fundamental demand. Adam started it for all of us. It's that woman, God. It's that woman. It's all her, God. You know, I was doing good in the garden until she came along. Yeah, well, what about all those wonderful nights you had? Oh, we don't talk about them, God. Let's talk about right now. It's her fault. The woman. That pet's fault you gave me, God. It's all your fault, God. You gave me this pet. Pet starts talking to me. It's all the pet's fault. Of course, Satan didn't have anybody to blame. He just stood there. We'll study that. It's a choice, people. 
So what we want to do, and I'll close with this, we didn't get through the passage, but I'll close with this. We want to develop a habit. That's what we want to do. We want to develop a habit. Hello? In case you start in the highway in the wreck. Okay. We then get the details later. And we need to pray. We need to get our minds set here. A lot of things are going to be demanded of us in the next 60 minutes of our life. A lot of things. We're going to have to go and look at the body, probably go out to the wreck site. A lot of things are going to be happening. Why the wreck occurred, that's going to start coming up. Insurance problems, all kinds of things are going to be happening just in the next 60 minutes of our life. Let's set our mind. Let's set our thinking to the things above. To the things that are eternal. Not related to the earth. It's a choice. That's a big example, but I could do this with, with just so many things, and we will do it. We learn to develop a habit from our childhood and things that happen in it. Satan grabs those strongholds, people. He keeps you going on that performance thing. It's my fault my child is dead. It's my fault this. It's all right. So I don't want to take the blame, so it must be your fault. And this whole thing just starts conjuring up all this inside of our soul. All these strongholds based on performance and opinion. What is everybody going to think about me? What's everybody going to think about us? Holy, those are all choices, people. They're choices by habit. And what we want to do is develop a whole new habit. That's what we want to do. We want to develop a whole new habit of keep seeking the things above and setting our mind. Set your mind on the things above. This is a habit. This doesn't just happen. Get that out of your mind. It doesn't just happen. It's got to become a habit. It's got to make this something we just do. Things start occurring in our life. And I used to major one then, but it can be just simple things to start adding up in the morning, in the afternoon. Things aren't going away. Uh, time frames aren't being met. Things aren't being done on time. On time. There's not enough time. All this kind of stuff. Boy, I can just see it starting to go. And Man, I gotta get to the gym, or I gotta get to the bar, I gotta get somewhere. This is just falling apart! See? Or, hey, wait a minute. What's happening here? I'm in the flesh. The flesh is trying to deal with the things of the earth. I need to back up. Excuse me just a minute, I gotta go to the restroom. Do I need to go? No. I just need to go back up. Set my mind. Talk this to a 14 year old girl. Or just watch miracles start occurring. Just, I, need to, I need to set my mind. We study this together. I need to keep seeking the things above. Let, don't let all these things down here do all this to you people. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. If we keep our minds set on the things above, it's eternal. You'll see that stress just sort of, I really don't care about it. The stress is gone. A lot of anxiety is gone. I'm going to show you this, people, in so many areas, the sins of others, the failures of others, the disappointments that others bring to us. You're going to see how this doesn't stress you out anymore. And it doesn't bring great depression on you anymore because you're going to think about the cross and the things above, things that are eternal. And things that just used to really stress me yesterday, when you start doing this, when you start developing this habit, you're just going to see it. Those things will just drift into the shadows in your life. And what you thought couldn't be possible. There's no way I couldn't get stressed or depressed on these things. You're going to start saying, yeah, like a little 14-year-old girl, yeah, you really can. You can just stop all that. We had a wonderful journey. She argued, no, no, it's not a choice. It just happens. It's something that happens to you. And after about an hour and a half, she smiles and says, it is a choice, isn't it? Yeah, it is. She made a big journey. A lot of Christians won't make that trip. And I hope you will. But it is a choice. It's a choice we make. Because we're living on earth. Living related to the things on earth rather than the things eternal. Any questions? I do, I do solicit your questions. If you don't feel comfortable in asking them, write them down, call me, uh, whatever. But I do solicit your questions because this is the kind of study that will do that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Jim Passmore, it's your fault I didn't make it through all these notes. Yeah. <laughs> Those of you that were here Sunday morning, 
I, I did this whole thing about having a plan and God has a plan and, and Jim walked up and I said, Jim, look, I have, you know, I forgot, I'm either down there at page 25 and here we are back on page 19. And, and, I, and Jim says, some of us have a plan, some of us will let God have a plan. And I'm like, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what an awesome God you are. But not long ago, Heavenly Father, we just felt that stress and depression and all these things that we experience, that they're natural. They're just things you do and have to put up with in life. And then we come to you. And like a loving father, you say, no, that isn't true. You don't have to. You tell us we can if we want, but we don't have to. Because you have provided us freely and by grace the means of not experiencing these stress, anxiety, and depression. What an awesome God you are. We praise you, Father, in your Son's precious name. Amen.